Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on the show, out of the galleries and into the streets. This week on the program, I talk with one of the most recognized street artists in the world. Her name is Swoon. How we use our public space is fiercely contested. We can hold a ticket tape parade for a winning sports team or shut down a city for security, but meet, occupy, disrupt with art? That's not always so easy, as our next guest well knows. Caledonia Curry, also known as Swoon, is one of the most recognized street artists in the world. And she's brought her art from the streets to the galleries to projects like musical houses in New Orleans, a ceramic tile factory in Pennsylvania, a floating city on rafts, and a rebuilding community in Haiti. I'm very happy to have Swoon here with us on the show. Hi, Swoon. Welcome to the program. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Thank you. So, so street art, did you start in the street? Did you start in the galleries? Which? Well, I started in the street more or less, although I have a fine arts background. But very immediately upon moving to New York and beginning to study, I realized that I needed to make something which was more deeply involved in my life. And that was kind of my first answer. So when did that all begin and how? That began about 19. 1999, uh, 2000, I was still in school at the time and I just had a sort of a breakdown around painting and around the kind of channels of fine arts and the role of art in mm -hmm. our lives in that way. And so I just started to create projects that would function differently and the first one was a series of posters that happened outside on the street and it became like a kind of a total obsession from there. Mm. So what upset you about the sort of normal run-of-the-mill art business world. Yeah, well, I think that there's this feeling that what you're going to make is a square that's for investment that goes over a couch and that that's the whole of its life cycle. And for me, I was like, no, creativity is everything to me. I need to make something that is my life, that's part of my life, that intersects with the city, how we live our lives, how we perceive ourselves, how we occupy our spaces. You know, I wanted to kind of get creative in a way that would turn the wheel of how I understood my own life and mm -hmm. so it was it for me it's been a process of answering that question in about a thousand different ways so how does it go from I've seen you put up your work on the street mm -hmm. but then I've also seen you work with entire communities of people mm -hmm. um, how does that part happen is it just yeah. automatically people yeah. come up they want to take part <laughs> <laughs> well I think that um, as an artist I have a kind of a few different personalities. One of them needs a very much alone time and needs to be creating something in the studio, very detailed and intensive and a kind of a, a work of art. So that, the artist in the garret. You. There, there you go. And then, but, but after a while I start going, oh my God, like there's this other part of me. I need to engage with people. I need to be around people. I need to be working together with people because I feel like that's kind of one of our deepest human needs is like working together on things. So then what happens to the artistic vision? Well, then there's the struggle. So you kind of bring that into community and all of a sudden it's like this whole other process and you have to really be willing to let go of a lot of things to understand that your ideas are definitely not always the best ideas mm -hmm. and to, to be fed by the ideas of others and be brave enough to share your mm. ideas, kind of all of these things. And then oftentimes after like a few months of that, I'm like, oh my God, I need to go back in the studio and <laughs> just do my own thing for a little while. You know, so it's, for me, it's a cycle. So tell us a little bit about the Haiti project, which sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. So the project in Haiti started five years ago, kind of in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake. And the moment that I had was that I had been working on the floating rafts that you talked about. Mm. And it was a thing that I had done with a huge group of people. And we kind of essentially had moved mountains in order to make this really ridiculous, wonderful thing happen. And the whole time I was like, this is amazing. But what would happen if we used this much creative resourcefulness and brought it to a, to a situation of crisis or need? Like, how would that you know, could we sort of do as unlikely th of things? And so I, artists as problem solvers. Basically, yeah, and as kind of human being communicators. And so I got together with a small group of friends right after the quake, and we said, okay, let's put our minds to this problem. And we connected with a small village uh, who were farmers who were kind of organizing themselves um, in, the, in an organization called the Mango Growers Association. Mm -hmm. And they were just outside the epicenter of the quake, and they were kind of a little bit 
out of the, the pathway of a lot of aid. And so we connected with them directly. And I kind of soon found that there was a real magic in being a small group of human beings connecting directly with another mm. small group of human beings and just saying like, hey, let's work together and kind of reaching for resources from my own creative community in New York and bringing them to this situation of rebuilding after the earthquake. And so the first project that we did was actually um, beginning with a community center. Um, and then we did some rebuilding uh, two homes. And now we're working with the farmers who want to start a bamboo project mm -hmm. around trying to see how that kind of fits in architecturally and also doing some kind of after school programming and different things because I started a bit naively and quickly realized that what we were building was a very long-term relationship mm. with the place. The thing that we heard a lot after the earthquake was that earthquakes of this magnitude had happened um, in a lot of other places but weren't nearly as devastating. Um, and what we saw when we got here was that that was basically a result of the economic situation, that everything is imported, all the building materials are really expensive. People can't afford to use enough of the right material. And so you have all of these, you know, cinder block building after cinder block building that's just Pancaked. Our solution to the problem that we really saw there was to um, go with an earth bag style of building. The actual shape of it is very strong and it uses less material per square footage than say a square house would. The structural integrity, uh, just the shape of a dome and the shape of a circle, both have the property of distributing any exterior force throughout the whole shape rather than with a square or rectangular building which only takes the force at one point. What I think really meant a lot to people was that we came back because people were like, oh, you didn't just show up, do one thing, not even finish it, and then leave. Oui, parce que bien que nous parcons toutes mais nous ca you know me qui ca aider nous construire, montrer l'autre nous construire forme type de cas ça parce que nous fait un peu d'expérience là. The greatest thing about earth bag building is, with some healthy hard work, you can build your own house rather than paying someone else to build your house for you. A third of our budget goes directly to employing local laborers and cooks and skilled masons and craftspeople. The creation of jobs was really, really every bit as important as the creation of the structure. So we've learned a lot in the first two buildings and now we are trying to create something which, you know, we've had a, a few community meetings, we've asked like what's working, what's not working about these structures, um, and we want to create something that continues to evolve in a way that's like in direct kind of reciprocity with what we're receiving as feedback. Okay. Informatique, okay. mécanique, okay. plomberie. Tout le monde, 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 tout le tout le monde, 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 so what would be your advice to people who are working for all those nonprofits that got mm -hmm. so criticized mm. by for collecting so much money and mm. using so much of it themselves? Right. I mean, I don't believe that I really have a kind of a, a huge structural answer because some of the problems really are huge structural sure. problems. But in my own experience, the kind of small human scale was very effective. And so I would just say to not forget that, to not underestimate what one group of people can do when they reach out directly to another group of people. So that gets to the question of the value of art in a, in a way. I know mm -hmm. you're doing more than art in Haiti. but. Yeah. In the introduction, I talked about how contested public space is mm, mm -hmm. and how difficult it is to get partly legislative mm -hmm. and police department buy-in mm. to disruptions that art for sports or winning a war or yeah. uh, I don't know what else. Mm -hmm. um, what case do you make to, to funders, to communities to say, you know what, let's do this today. Mm -hmm. Let's put up this piece of street art. Let's work together on this piece of art. Um, mm -hmm. You can't eat it necessarily. Mm -hmm. It's not going to feed people. Mm -hmm. It's going to do something else. Mm -hmm. What do you say? Well, I, I guess I have quite a few different answers yeah, to that, but the first, one that, <laughs> the first one that pops to my mind just has to do with people's sense of 
like what happens when people get to be a hands-on part of creating their community that I think that so many of us are born into systems that are already in place and so there's a kind of a sense of alienation from those systems and from the physical world and so I think that when we are creatively able to set our hands on something um, and able to be a part of the kind of the small and creative decisions of making our place we feel at home we care about our home more we feel that it represents us and that it that we are able to kind of just feel more invested in and take care of it in a different way. Um, and so I just think that like giving people creative outlet to be a part of having a say in what their city looks like is just part of a healthy community mm. in my opinion. And, and how does it intersect with the discussion around gentrification? Because mm -hmm. everything I'm hearing you say is mm -hmm. about bringing people out mm -hmm. to express their creativity. Mm -hmm. But you're still going in and mm -hmm. in some places mm -hmm. the artist arriving is a yeah, alarm bell that the that the neighbors about to, the neighbors about to price them out. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting because when I very first started working on the street, the discussion around public space was completely different oh, than so. it is now because it was. I think that I was. It was in that kind of post September 11th era where the sort of we were. It was everyone was thinking about the kind of corporate takeover of public spaces and there wasn't yet as much of an alarm that like the artist coming into a space and kind of being creative is an alarm bell which it is now and I absolutely see that and so that's just been really interesting for me to kind of watch and be a part of and I would say that some of the ways that I think about it are going from the temporary action to the long-term action so when I started wheat pasting on the street I was like put up a poster leave right and then the project for example that I have working on in Braddock is you have a group of artists who are sort of working on... Is this the ceramic tile factory? The ceramic tile factory, exactly. So we're working on a church and working to save this church from demolition. But in doing so, we're working on creating jobs for people locally to be a part of the recreation of this space. Mm. So the kind of direct answer to gentrification of being like, this isn't about... The actions aren't about pushing people out. The actions are about actually providing more opportunity and really digging in deeply to like who is here, what opportunities are needed, how can we answer those needs, and how can we do it creatively. What kind of skills are people coming away? Um, in this instance, it'll be about tile making. So it'll be about the ceramic tile making, kind of of all different kinds, from the very simple, you know, just like press molds to sort of silk screening and designing and the kind of more artisanal. There's some video of the Braddock project. Mm -hmm. um, let's take a look. Hi, welcome to North Braddock. I'm here with the Heliotrope Foundation and we are opening an art space community center and we want you to learn more about the Braddock Tiles project and hopefully to be a part of it. The Braddock Tiles project started many years ago when we were introduced to this building. I remember the moment of kind of just like looking up into the cavernous space and I just had these really powerful visions of people being in this space and working in this space and using this space in so many different ways. I go to school in Woodland Hills High School. I would just come up after school, just a little after school activity. I think of it like a good opportunity to learn how to build stuff and how to communicate with other people. You know, it's all about learning new stuff. I'm interested in the relationship of a building that gets built for people, that's built by people that are inhabiting it, that will nurture it and help build the community around it. There's some ways in which we're leaving the true life of the buildings open so that people in the neighborhood are really forming what happens within the building. The funds that we're able to raise are going to go towards setting up the ceramics workshop in the church basement. Buying kilns, supplies, mixers, all the things that you need to make uh, professional grade roofing tiles. That's the first step in rebuilding the building as a whole. Uh, it will give us a new roof that's beautiful, that's sustainable, that lasts 75 years. And if we're able to raise enough towards salaries for our first year of apprentices. This is a town that knows how to make stuff and we're just offering a space for people to make beautiful things by hand. Yeah, that's, that's really good. <laughs> 
for the tile studio, it's going to take the skill set of ceramicists like KT and people like Harmony who are kind of showing us these different methods of working with ceramic tiles and different methods of working really creatively, kind of both using these really ancient old techniques from like the 1600s and using these kind of new techniques that people are developing right now. And then the pieces that I feel really excited to bring to that puzzle are things that are inspired by the work that we're doing in Haiti, for example, with the kind of experiential learning center that we have started. Or some of the kind of just really like wonder-based activities that we have in the project in New Orleans with like musical architecture and different kinds of experimentation and learning and a kind of a community resource that are all happening in the same place at the same time. For me, it feels really exciting, the idea of being able to really create a structure, kind of an anchor in this community. You've also done work in, in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. um, I think this episode's gonna be broadcasting during Mardi oh, yeah. Gras. So, so tell us a little <laughs> bit about that work. Um, so the project in New Orleans, strangely enough, it actually did start in a kind of a way. Um, post Katrina, it's been it's had a really long arc, and I had a friend who was living in the Bywater post Katrina, and who was watching sort of communities all over New Orleans get you know, bust out, people were leaving for Texas, people weren't coming back. He was kind of afraid of the corporatization of the culture in the mm -hmm. wake of so much of New Orleans culture leaving. And so he just had this thought of being like, let's not only bring in people who are kind of doing it themselves, but also connect them with people locally and just try to like, you know, have this like, celebration of New Orleans culture, which is happening internationally and locally. Mm -hmm. And um, so he asked me to work on this house that was about to fall down next to his house. And I was kind of thinking about music and architecture and wonder and how like those two aspects of New Orleans culture are so key. And so I just started thinking of a kind of a playable musical installation that would be incorporated in this house somehow. And between the dream and the realization, that original house actually fell down. Mm. Um, and so, but we had already kind of built up a lot of enthusiasm around it. And so um, the group that I worked with, New Orleans Airlift, kind of said, okay, let's keep going with this. And so we sort of reinvented that original idea um, into building new structures that would incorporate musicality. And, you know, just thinking about once, you know, you create these really unlikely kinds of moving structures and when they pop up in different places in the city and people are allowed to interact with them, I don't really know quite how to describe it, but there's just this like very strange joy that's born out of the unlikeliness of, of, of those moments. And um, yeah, so we've, we've been kind of going ever since of continuing to experiment and collaborate with people locally and people from kind of all over and bringing together this like traditional and experimental mm. sort of um, art form. <laughs> so properties, houses with musicality. There's a, there's a video. Can mm. you set it up for us? What are we going to see? So what we're going to see is a video from City Park. Um, we have been working on this kind of roving musical village and one of its iterations was this summer in City Park and it was a village of musical houses with kind of hundreds of collaborators and beautiful performances and so that's what you're going to be taking a look at. All right, take a look.
had Molly Crabapple, the mm -hmm. um, graphic journalist, uh, on the show not so long ago, and she talked about the sort of strangeness of having one of her um, protest posters mm -hmm. um, gathered in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art. Yeah. Uh, would you like to see your street art peeled off the wall put in the <laughs> gallery? I mean, here's the thing. Um, I think when I make pieces for the street, I really do consider them just for that place. Um, but actually, when I was still waitressing in New York, I got a call from the Museum of Modern Art, and they were like, can you come here and bring some things? And I was so confused. And I came, and I like brought a bunch of stuff and laid it out on the table, and they actually acquired a couple pieces oh, for so their you collection. Know exactly what this like. <laughs> so I do, and it was really mind-blowing. And it, I kind of realized very quickly, I had a lot of sort of trepidation at first about what it would mean to be a part of an institution after I had already built so much of my life outside of institutions. And I just kind of realized that it's not, it's not kind of mutually exclusive, that like institutions represent one kind of container for creativity. It's just that for me, they can't be the only container. Yeah. yeah. Well, talking about containers, you were part of a video not so long ago um, lending your support to the cultural boycott mm -hmm. of Israel, yeah. uh, part of the BDS boycott, divestment mm -hmm. sanctions campaign. Yeah. Why was that an important thing for you to do? You know, I think that at the moment, you know, I have spent a very, very little bit of time in Palestine and just thought a lot about the issue of kind of human interconnectedness and compassion and how we can kind of learn to tolerate each other and struggle. And at the moment, you know, of thinking about the cultural boycott, I was talking it over with a friend of mine, Josh McPhee, who's like just an old and very well-respected political activist in my world. And, you know, he just sort of said, like, this is one of those moments where a very specific group of people is calling to the world for a specific set of actions. And it's kind of, it's not that we have to invent necessarily what to do, it's a kind of a response of like, okay, we hear what is being asked and we become part of that conversation. And so for me, I think that moment was just about trying to kind of look at the history of cultural boycott, how it functioned in South Africa, how it could function now, and just kind of lending my voice to that larger mm -hmm. conversation. So what, we started by talking about public space and I'd love to end there. There's a mm -hmm. phrase, a term that comes up a lot in, the U, in, in New York these days, privately owned public space. And I was mm. like, come on. <laughs> um, you, you can't uh, p pervert our language that far. Mm -hmm. But the argument is made, public spaces are under attack, they're shrinking, they're poorly maintained. Why not let a corporation own mm. the plaza? Mm -hmm. um, they'll still let you come in. Right. Until... Right. I mean, it, for me, the thing that pops into my mind is the cabaret laws, right? That it was like, oh, who cares about these laws? They're just on the books. They're from the 20s. It's not a big deal. Why are we so worried about them? And then it was like, well, we're worried about them because when somebody wants to use them for a specific end, they will. And we saw that happening in New York when, you know, there was just this huge kind of crackdown that was citing this archaic law or like, oh, of course you can still use these public spaces until this particular corporation doesn't agree with this agenda. And then all of a sudden, it's not open to you. And so, I mean, I think it's so important to really like have truth around what is public and what is civic and what is participatory. Public art in public places. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Swoon's work continues. We have some videos on our website. Take a look. Thanks for coming on the program. Thank you. What would our world look like today if our media showed us as much collaboration as they do competition? What if we got to meet people making change right here, right now, in all sorts of ways we're usually told are impossible? Subscribe today to The Laura Flanders Show for in-depth interviews with forward-thinking people. Smarts, not sound bites, every week, right here. Subscribe and thanks. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on the show, Academy Award nominee Viggo Mortensen on speaking out for justice and remembering to act. People need to take matters into their own hands, not just when things are bad. That's, the, that's why things get bad. All that and a few words from me on Hillary Clinton's warmth and her wars. Welcome to our program. Drawing sex workers, drawing prisoners, drawing blood. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, graphic journalist Molly Crabapple joins me. Whenever you work in the sex industry, even in the legal end, you've given up you know, your good white girl privilege. Right. You've given up any notion that society is going to protect you. And I have a few words to say on the very dark magic arts of the art market. Mm -hmm.